about you and him I don't care about what has been I only care about your soft skin Cause we're still sleeping in my head I don't care about you and him I don't care about what has been I only care about your soft skin Hey, hello, I'm Julie Jo. Welcome to my channel. If you're new here, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. If you like channels focused on cults, multi-level marketing companies, breaking them down, scams, all of that stuff, and talking about the manipulation that goes on and all of that, you might want to subscribe to this channel. If you're not new here, welcome back. Go ahead and subscribe if you're not new. And if this is your second or third or fourth or fifth video, I really appreciate it. Today, we're going to be talking about multi-level marketing companies and go in depth as to why I personally think they are cults. So everything in this video is my personal opinion and all my sources are going to be below in the description. This is going to go into extreme detail about cults and multi-level marketing companies and I'm going to use examples as to why I believe that they are cults and I would love to hear your comments below and what you think about this topic that we're covering and what's going on. After we cover all my thoughts on that and talk about the sources that I've used and so on and so forth. We're going to watch a Monate video training that was a ministry video as someone with a master's degree in that topic, which I'll talk about later. I think that this will be an extremely interesting video. And with all the conversation beforehand about cults and uh, just kind of dissecting that and lining it up with multi-level marketing companies, I think it might make the video even that much more interesting. So let's get started. When it comes to cults, many of us think of cults like the Jim Jones cult or Heaven's Gate and things so extreme that ended up taking people's lives. But those aren't the only cults that ultimately hurt people. Whether it's financially, emotionally, mentally, there are many out there. Words like brainwashing are used and oftentimes we think of people almost like in a zombie state, right? Zombie-like, doing every little thing that their leader asked them to do with zero thought or input. Sure, that exists to a point, but I think that idea clouds what's really going on and lets other cults get away with their less deadly but extremely awful agenda. Zoe Heller wrote this article from the New York, New York Times that is cited below, and she says, it's possible that our traditional definition of what constitutes a cult organization will have to adapt to the internet age and a new model of crowdsourced cults. And she goes on to say, people's attachment to the an initial idealistic vision of a cult often keeps them in it, long after experience would appear to have exposed the fantasy. The psychologist Leon Festinger proposed the theory of cognitive dissonance to describe the unpleasant feeling that arises when an established belief is confronted by clearly contradictory evidence. Like when a leader of a cult says they're immortal, but ends up dying and some of the followers continue to believe and do what was taught by that leader. That's cognitive dissonance in a nutshell, and we see it a lot in multi-level marketing companies. Not exactly in that exact situation, but cognitive dissonance nonetheless. In my opinion, religion in of itself is not a cult. However, what you do with that religion can easily create one. I have a master's degree in theology and ministry with a bachelor's in cross-cultural studies and a minor in Christian education. While I'm not an expert on cults, I do know quite a bit about religion and have done my fair share of research and listening to experts on cults. Today we're going to be watching a Monet video, a multi-level marketing company where they use religion to emotionally, mentally, and even physically manipulate their downlines who make them money. Monet has had a very difficult year to say the least, with a net loss of almost 30,000 distributors by the third month of 2022, March of 2022. So they're grasping for anything at this point. They, in my opinion, will even happily manipulate people using their religion. As we know, oftentimes religion can mean everything to someone. So when someone they know and trust takes advantage of that, they won't always see it. I've had many people ask, why? Why are they still in it, the MLM? Are they just dumb, ignorant, brainwashed? Let's talk about why for a second and then a few ways this happens. Humans tend to fall for these kinds of things due to a hardwire weakness for stories. Bernstein says, humans understand the world through narratives. He writes, 
However much we flatter ourselves about our individual rationality, a good story, no matter how analytically deficient, lingers in the mind, resonates emotionally, and persuades more than the most dispositive facts or data. What makes them work is not their plot, but their promise. Here is an answer to the problem of how to live. Or here is a way to become rich beyond your wildest dreams. In both cases, the prompting of common sense, is it a bit odd that aliens have chosen just me and my friends to save you from the destruction of America? Is it likely that Bernie Madoff has a foolproof system that can earn all investors 10% a year? are effectively obscured by the loveliness of the fantasy prospect. And once you've entered into a delusion, you are among people who have all made the same commitment, who are all similarly intent on maintaining the lie. So we see it's a bit more complicated than ignorance. We all likely believe in something that we didn't or can't use logic to reason with others why. It's based solely on emotion we have all the potential to fall for a cult. A quote from someone who left a dangerous cult rings in my mind a lot since I read it. The person said, nobody joins a cult, nobody. They join something they think is a good thing and then realize they were F-U-C-K-E-D since YouTube decided they no longer like cuss words. <laughs> We will get to the video shortly, but I want to briefly talk about a few ways that, in my opinion, those people have been able to do what we are about to see. The first one is called Neuro Linguistic Programming. The first act is of establishing and maintaining rapport between the practitioner and the client, which is achieved through pacing and leading the verbal and nonverbal behavior of the client. So when I read this, I instantly think how in MLMs, especially Monet, you are to give value to others, aka build rapport. Through that, you start a conversation and figure out what this company, product, business could do for them. Continuing, once rapport is established, the practitioner may gather information about the client's present state, as well as help the client define a desired state or goal for the interaction. The practitioner pays particular attention to the verbal and nonverbal responses as the client defines the present state and desired state and any resources that may be required to bridge the gap. The client is typically encouraged to consider the consequences of the desired outcome and how they may affect his or her personal or professional life and relationships, taking into account any positive intentions of any problems that may arise. Here we see how they don't just figure out what you need, but use that to show how this company can change your life, relationships, financial situation, and so on. This is directly from the MLM playbook, in my opinion. Fourth, the practitioner assists the client in achieving the desired outcomes by using certain tools and techniques to change internal representation and responses to stimuli in the world. Finally, the changes are quote unquote, future paced by helping the client to mentally rehearse and integrate the changes into his or her life. For example, the client may be asked to step into the future and represent, mentally see, hear, and feel what it is like having already achieved the outcome. This to me really speaks loudly about MLMs because they use so many different tactics to get you to picture your future, from vision boards, which aren't inherently bad, to goal setting techniques. You might go, oh, but those are bad for people to do. Not at all. Unless you're deceived into thinking you reach them in a position where 99% of people don't and won't. I'm sure many of you have experienced something like this, so feel free to comment below. The last thing I want to talk about before we get started is called coercive persuasion, which is another word for brainwashing, but I think this is a better word, example, thing to use because it doesn't have that idea of like, oh, you have to be a zombie to be brainwashed behind it. It's just coercive persuasion. And I think this will help us deconstruct what it looks like in today's world on the internet to brainwash someone. Brainwashing someone or using coercive persuasion isn't simple. You have to use different techniques to get someone to actually change their belief system, thought process, and the way they feel and act. 
These coercive persuasion techniques can be divided into four types. You have social environmental, emotional, cognitive, and those that induce disassociative states. So I'm not going to talk so much about the bite model on this video, but the bite model is an excellent way to see if you are a part of a cult or something is a cult. It's by Stephen Hassan. I think that's how you say his last name. Not sure. And the bite model is behavior control, information control, thought control, and emotional control. And if you just type in bot, bite model, B-I-T-E model, Stephen Hassan, H-A-S-S-A-N, then you should be able to find it. It's great, but it's a bit long. And I've talked about it plenty before, and I will likely talk about it plenty more. I'm going to use this source and the sources below, so feel free to go and read about it. Social environmental techniques, so the first of the four, these kinds of techniques manipulate or control the subject's surroundings or environment. The, the goal is to weaken the individual's resistance in order to make it easier to persuade them. Some of the social environmental coercive persuasive techniques are isolation. This makes it easier for the subject to be persuaded. It consists of closing the subject off from the world mentally, socially, and physically. In other words, completely isolating the individual. People in MLMs are often told that those who don't support your business don't support you. Therefore, cutting people out who might see more clearly than they do about this particular endeavor. And feel free to add to any of the topics we're going to talk about or add your own topic below. I am just simply hitting these as best I can and as quick and efficient as possible so that we can get to the video. Information control is the next one, which we see in Stephen Hassan's bite model. The control and manipulation of information constitutes a form of isolation. With less information, the subject won't have as many options to choose from. Their critical thinking will also be limited. I find this to be one of the biggest issues because you're told, at least in my opinion, not to watch anything negative about the company, the team, the person, whatever, because those people are quote unquote ignorant and jealous and failed. But if you did watch, you'd see that those telling you this are lying. They aren't just, they aren't ignorant. They are jealous and some of them haven't even failed. And by the way, what is failing in an MLM? It's not quitting. Quitting does not equal failure. Just to add that in there. Those leaders know that they are lying, but don't want you to figure that out. Creating a state of existential dependency is the next one. This is making someone believe that their existence depends on someone else. Usually that someone is a kind of leader. In practice, it means satisfying someone's primary and secondary needs until their total dependency, until there is a total dependency. I know many of us find dependency in our mentors and friends and so on. In MLMs, they show themselves to you oftentimes as a mentor, hoping you put your entire self and trust that you have into your mentor and what they teach. You have to be fully committed or you, quote unquote, to them, fail. Those who failed aren't fully committed and didn't do what their mentor told them to, or so leaders in MLMs say. The next one and the last one of social environmental techniques is psychophysical debilitation. Some kinds of physical debilitation are associated with psychological debilitation. That in turn leads to a weakened ability to resist persuasion techniques. This topic I think could go into the chronic illness or disability community where MLMers really like to tap into. I'm, I'm not completely sure. This could even possibly relate to exhausted and burnt out moms, students, professionals, and so on. So feel free to comment your thoughts below on that. Emotional technique, which is the second one, motivations in this are emotionally conditioned. So motivations are emotionally conditioned. Consequently, if you can influence people's emotions, you will influence their motivations and their behavior. So there's only two with this. It says emotional activation of pleasure. This consists of charming people and treating them well. People use it to draw people in and grab their attention. I see a lot of this in MLMs especially and mostly at the beginning, the love bombing, the recognition and the importance of recognition that they push and a gift giving. I experienced that and I know many others who did as well. If you think of other things, feel free to comment below. The last one of the emotional is emotional activation of fear, guilt, and anxiety. 
using rewards and punishment to get emotional responses of fear, guilt, and anxiety. These emotions encourage dependency and submission. This goes for almost every Jesse Lee Ward training ever, but I digress. I won't go there. I think guilt is likely the biggest one in MLMs. They use all sorts of fear mongering as well. And they also use financial things to guilt you into working your so-called MLM business, saying you could stay home with your kids and give them all of you and all of your time. You could retire your husband as if they all want to be retired from their jobs. I don't, I know I don't, but like my husband might actually not hate that now that I think about it, but that's beside the point. <laughs> Acting like being successful will solve all of your problems, and the way to do that is to listen to them. Cognitive techniques is the next one, and these kinds of techniques draw from the two we already discussed. An individual who physically, who's physically weak and feels guilty is in a perfect position to be brainwashed or have coercive persuasion done to them. Denigration of critical thinking is one of the cognitive techniques. The perpetrator shows the individual the invalidity of following their own thoughts. Thus, every time they think something, they end up repressing it. So in MLMs, the leader acts like they know better. They want to get to know you and then use it against you. They want you to be vulnerable with them so they can, in my opinion, use their thought stopping techniques to stop from any critical thinking. Again, Feel free to add to any of these below. I'm just trying to move quickly to get to the video and I'm trying to hit the most important examples that I can think of as I'm writing this. Use of deceit and lies. Distorting reality by hiding information, lying, or deceiving. Easy in MLMs, they won't show you their income disclosure statement, their company made normally, and they get mad when people like myself do. And then they say, oh, well, it's not accurate. Homegirl, your company made it. It's probably a little better than how the company is actually doing, to be honest, in my opinion. Then there is the products. <laughs> Ooh, don't get me started. The weight loss, the depression curing, the chronic illness curing, the curing in general of products that are literally supplements that if they did those things that they say they did, the pharmaceutical companies would, I mean, just grab that as quickly as they can to make money on, to make money off of it. I mean, that's pretty straightforward, I think. So I know they don't do those things that you're saying they do, because if they did, the pharmaceutical companies would grab them. The next is demanding submission, and it's we're still in the cognitive techniques. Establishing the idea of group thought. Huge in MLMs, in my opinion. Demanding that the individual submits to what the group decides. In other words, developing conformity and submission. Oof, this is a big one in MLMs. Like I said, they all try to think act and sometimes even look the same. They all read the same books, watch the same trainings, and honestly they're told that doing and acting like your upline can lead you to success. I think at times they try to encourage you to have some individuality, but ultimately what does that do when you've had to conform to this particular group so much? You can have a niche, but it all comes back to the same thing. The multi-level marketing company, the product, the team. It all comes back to those specific things. The next one is group identity and the cognitive techniques. Identity has to be collective. So as a result, individuals lose their personality, take on the group's identity. This can make individuals lose any distinguishing characteristics. I really think that goes a lot with what we just spoke about. So I won't add more into that. Next one's controlling attention. Manipulating what takes up someone's attention means that you can also force them to pay attention to the persuasion attempts. When it comes to controlling attention, I think that this is very important when it comes to multi -level marketing companies because in this idea, it says manipulating what takes up someone's attention, that you can also force them to pay attention to the persuasion attempts. So their day is filled with MLM. Their day is filled with their team. Their day is filled with trainings. You have a what we called an IPA when I was in a multi-level marketing company. Income producing activity. We had this thing with it where it's part of your daily methods for success. So you do things daily. Their attention, your attention almost all of the time, or honestly all of the time, is on the MLM. The next one is control over language. Controlling language is a way of limiting freedom. Omitting certain words or phrases is one way of avoiding particular questions or evaluations. Wow. <laughs> there are some MLMs that will not use particular words. I think like job maybe one 
and I'm sure there's plenty that you can think of. They do not allow you to be negative whatsoever. There are certain things you cannot say, certain things you cannot do. It's very controlling over your language. The fact that they won't say certain words blows my mind. I'm trying to think of a particular company, I'm sure someone knows it below, where they won't say certain words that are normal everyday words. Changing the source of authority. This is the last one in the um, cognitive techniques. Once you tear down a person's principles of authority, you expose them to a totalitarian authority. Consequently, this authority figure gains all the power. Everyone has to submit. While that is an extreme thought, it also does, in my opinion, relate to multi-level marketing. Their upline, their number one, their top person, that's their authority figure. And Arbonne, Cecilia Stoll is the totalitarian authority of that company. And I'm sure that you can think of other companies like Monet, Christina Smallwood, totalitarian authority. But really, there's so many, it sounds odd, but like there are a totalitarian authority of each team. And then of all of those, there's like one. So in Monet, I think the overarching one is Tony Van Schoik, which you're going to hear from her in here. And then like Christina Smallwood would be of, of her team, right? Her huge downline. And the same goes for like Jacqueline, whatever her name is, and so on and so forth. The last section of this that I want to talk about before we get to the video uh, or the training is coercive persuasion techniques that induce disassociative states. This might be extreme and it might not be fully what we see in MLMs, but I think it's important to cover nonetheless. So disassociative, so disassociation corresponds to trance states that arise when an experience is intensified. These states lead to a momentary loss of consciousness and identity. They are more common in totalitarian environments. These states of consciousness also make followers more vulnerable. As a result, it's easier to control them by limiting their options and reducing their abil ability to evaluate. Coercive persuasion or brainwashing is when you manipulate someone's environment to weaken them. Cognitive and emotional persuasion change the way they think and feel. That, in turn, leads them to trance states that make them easier to persuade. So honestly, it sounds wild, but disassociative states I think are very common in multi-level marketing companies. Looking back, I definitely experienced those. Um, and I think a lot of the times I experienced them when I was listening to something that made me have cognitive dissonance. Growth is a big one in this video. Why? Because this last year was the exact opposite. <laughs> I mean, they just shot down. Uh, Monty had a really, really hard, difficult year. Maybe because of the exposure that they've been getting in a negative light. Who knows? A lot of people are suffering from this. The people, though, that aren't suffering so much and aren't really in a terrible position while well, maybe they're making less, they're still making six figures a month, would be Tony here. And those other people that you heard her say, those names, they, while growth is important to them, they're making so much money that honestly, the impact of the downfall hasn't been as big to them as it has been to these people in these comments who likely have lost an entire team and make no profit anymore and have to, as someone said, rebuild my team. It's pretty sad uh, looking at the comments and the fact that that they're taking someone's religion, who like I said when we were talking earlier, is everything to someone. And then an MLM business, which is so small in this world and is not supposed to be everything, they're mixing the two. It's like mixing red Play-Doh and blue Play-Doh and just kneading it and kneading it. It is going to be very, very hard to <laughs> separate the red and blue Play-Doh. Um, it's possible. I used to say it's like it's like red dye and water, but you can't unmix that. At least I don't think you can. I'm pretty sure you can. However, with the red and blue Play-Doh, you can. It's just going to be very, very difficult. And it's going to take a long time and it's going to take a lot of work. And that has been my experience with MLM and honestly, religion in general, I've suffered in my life from it for the most part. But um, with MLM, it was very difficult to take the blue Play-Doh and scrape it away from the red Play-Doh. It, it's so difficult once it's been kneaded for so long. And by kneading, I mean, you know, like 
meeting dough, K-N-E, you know? What I see when it comes to people in MLMs who say stuff like accountability with business and faith, it's that they're thinking that what they've done is not enough. And I mean, to me, that's an obvious look, maybe you look at it differently, but thinking that what they've done is not enough. And when it comes to MLMs, honestly, they kind of push that what you're doing is never enough. But when it comes to faith, that's very difficult to decipher because someone's always doing more than you in faith. And this idea that every new year in money or in multi-level marketing company can be a better year. But hopefully, and my hope for these people is, while it's sad, honestly, is that they go through this year and realize that they are enough, but it's never going to be enough for the multi-level marketing company. Tony, being the top, is never enough still for the company. Let's say in regular businesses, the CEO is the top. You've made it. Okay, you're there. But when it comes to MLMs, you can always make more money. You can always do more. You can always build more. All of that. And it's, in my experience, was extremely exhausting. And the feeling that you're never enough in both your MLM and your religion is very hard. I think that because they're tying religion and MLM together, they're never going to feel like they're enough in their religion and in their faith because they have it tied to their MLM, which is impossible to be enough in. I hope that makes sense. Also haven't really watched this fully or written anything down. I'm just kind of going in it as y'all are. Now that we've talked about all of this, I think we should get started on the Monate Ministry video. So keep in mind what we've talked about as you watch and add your thoughts on the video below in the comments. I'd love to see it. And I'd love to have a conversation with you in the comments. So I will say that I will be skipping the parts of worship music because they do worship in this. I just don't think that there's anything for us to talk about other than maybe the lyrics. And honestly, I don't want to watch that part. So I will go ahead and press play, buckle up, and don't forget what we just talked about. If you need to go rewatch that section, you can. I think though it's going to be crucial for us to have a conversation with this video. And honestly, I think it's just going to prove all the points that we just talked about. So let's get started. Hi, everyone. This is Tony Van Schoik. I'm so excited to have you guys with us tonight. We are doing our annual Bless Our Business call, and I'm so super excited to have all of these amazing people here on with us tonight. Um, so we're going to kick it off, and uh, I want you to drop in the chat box, if you haven't already, where you're from, what you're excited for, what is, what is your faith-based goal for 2023? I want to briefly go back to kind of what we talked about and how in our coercive persuasion section we talked about emotional techniques cognitive techniques and things of that nature right social environmental techniques and this is crucial because religion impacts every single aspect of someone's life from social emotional um, cognitive everything the religion their belief spirituality whatever it is that kind of thing impacts every aspect of someone's life therefore if you mix something with it, that thing is also going to impact every aspect of your life. You go into religion not thinking you're going to go away from religion. So if you've watched videos or heard from people or even me about having to separate yourself from religion, it's taken, I mean, I'm still not completely separate. I still have thought, it's, it's a whole thing. It takes years of therapy, years of deconstruction. It, it's wild how much it takes to pull yourself apart from that that goes along with anything you mix it with and that's why cults are so dangerous because they almost always include your religion or something that you wholeheartedly believe in something that you um look at and go this is why i'm here on earth this is what i'm alive for therefore you think that about your religion then you think about that about the thing that you mix it with being in this situation money sadly so we're going to kick it off we're going to hear some a little bit of music we're going to hear a little bit of some of my favorite people talk about their ministry what they've been able to do um but i'm going to start and you guys so here's the best part is that Stuart, our president is going to minister at the end of this call and he's going to share with us all of his wonderful wisdom and you guys 
If you have never seen him minister before, uh, I actually asked him last year for the first time to do in Vegas. I'm hoping he does it again. And we do this every uh, Sunday morning after uh, monations, but um, stay tuned because this is getting so much better because this is who we are as a company. This is who we are as being um, a faith-based company and just sharing with you without further ado, Phil, are you there? Because Phil who is actually an, an incredible leader in, in, in ministry. ministry. He's going to kick us off. Kick us off. Us off. Hey, Tony. Hi. Family, family. Happy New Year 2023. We're so pumped and excited for all that God has in store this year. And I know we're all sharing words. And my word for the year is power, strength, power. It comes from 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And uh, Paul says this, my grace is sufficient for you. So even though I don't know all of what 2023 has in store, I don't know the future. But what I do know is that God's grace is sufficient. And then Paul finishes that verse by saying, my power is made perfect. God's power is made perfect in your weakness. With all due respect to Christians, I have a serious issue with Paul. I actually would drop kick him if I saw him today. You know, I know he's like not here anymore, but, and I'm not going to go in depth into it, but I got some problems with Paul, especially like throughout, <laughs> throughout my, uh, schooling i was like well this guy's a piece of anywho i just want to add that in because anytime i can talk crap about paul i will <laughs> sorry i know i really don't want to offend anyone please know that if you love paul good for you i just don't and i don't know about you but i got a lot of weaknesses and so the more weaknesses i have the more power and strength god is going to work through me and so i'm going to lead a song tonight and uh whether you're sitting on the couch or driving in your car or you got kids in the background i just hope that this song ministers to you to not fear the future because God is in control, to not fear what is to come in 2023. Even though we don't know the future, we know the one that holds the future in the palm of his hands, and that's God. So the song is called Fear Is Not My Future, and uh, one of the uh, choruses on this is it's like a welcome to peace. It says, hello peace, hello joy, hello love, hello strength, hello hope, it's a new horizon. And so maybe your year has started out um, not like you expect. Here's the problem that I have with worshiping in this setting, because what you're saying is going to be mixed in with what the freaking setting is. I'm about to get a little passionate, a little more passionate than I wanted to get. I need to bring it down a little bit. The lyrics of fear is not my future. I'll just read them to you. And again, when you're singing this kind of thing in a setting, that setting and what you're there for becomes part of the lyrics. So it says, let him turn in your favor. Watch him work it for your good. Because he's not done with what he started. He's not done until it's good. When I read that, they're saying, God's not done with your money business until it's good. Until you're successful. Until blah, 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 blah. That's the idea of that lyric with this situation. It goes on, so let him turn into your favor, watch him work for your good. He's not done with what he started. He's not done until it's good. It says, hello, peace, hello, joy, hello, love, hello, strength, hello, hope, it's a new horizon. Hello, peace, hello, joy, hello, love, hello, strength, hello, hope, it's a new horizon. And when you're, when you're listening to that chorus, you start to feel those things. Because again, this is more than, this is more than just a song that you're singing. And I think all of us have felt this with music in general. Music's very, very, very powerful. Hello, peace. Hello, joy. Hello, love. Hello, strength. Hello, hope. So even if your business is like pff, it bad, right? And, and you are losing money and all of this is actually hurting you. In this moment, you're going to feel these things in this situation. And you're no longer going to see those things that are actually bad because you're going to feel peace, joy, love, strength, and hope. And you're going to have this new sense of, it's like refreshment, right? Like you're refreshed. That's how people talk about on Sunday church. I mean, there's more to it. We could go into it. Oh, we'll do this next one because I'm just reading it. If you're ready for a breakthrough, yeah, just open up and just receive, hey, because what he's pouring out is nothing you've ever seen. You've ever seen. I mean... The next one, fear is not my future, you are, you are. Sickness is not my story, you are, you are. Heartbreak's not my home, you are, you are. Death is not the end, you are, you are. This is for faith, not money. And it goes on to get even worse. You're writing my story, you're writing my story. Here we go, one more time, one more time. Fear is not, fear is not my future. You are, you are. So you're writing my story, you're writing my story. So, I mean, if you take all of these things and you put them in this, training, ministry, whatever, of Monet, 
it really makes a lot of sense for them to do this to their downlines so that their downlines feel even more kneaded, right? And by kneaded, I mean like kneading dough in, right? The Play-Doh, the blue, the red, or whatever. You're kneading that. It's going to knead a little more every single time something like this is going on. A little bit more kneading right there. It's going to keep going, and it's going to be even more difficult to separate the two. Okay, let's keep going. I'm actually going to skip his singing because I don't want to listen to it. I'm sure he's great, but let's listen to, well, I don't want to listen to her either, but we're going to listen to Connie. My heart's just pounding and I just um, am overwhelmed. I love worship so much. It's my favorite thing in the whole world. And that song, you guys, um, for those of you, if you might put it in the chat, Fear Is Not My Future by, um, who is it, babe? Oh, Brandon Lake. Is it Brandon Lake? Yeah. Isn't it Maverick City too? Maverick City, Brandon Lake, you're going to find it. It's phenomenal. Let those words sink in and flood your heart and mind. Woo! Love it. Thank you, baby. He's going to go take care of the babes. Um, okay, so you guys, we were just talking last night or the night before about our words, like Phil shared, his is power. And the word I picked is joy. And oddly enough, Stuart's word is joy too. He's, there, isn't it cool how God works? None of us planned what we were all going to say, but it's all going to mesh together so, so well. Um, and I picked the word joy and I want to encourage you guys with something in this because even as a believer, as a pastor's wife, as someone who would say, I know true joy, right? Not the world's kind of joy that's based off circumstances. I know the joy of the Lord, even knowing that you guys, I too struggle and I struggled in 2022 with what comes honestly naturally to me. And, um, just with a lot of mental type of things going on and just mom stuff and all that. What you see is that she says she struggled with 2022 and all of them are essentially going to say they struggled because their monate business struggled. It's the first time they really had a big downward spiral in money. Now, don't worry. They're still making plenty of money. They're just not making the money that they were. So therefore, again, their joy, their everything in this ministry, you know, she says ministry comes easy to her. Mm, I beg to differ, but you know, I don't know her. So maybe I'm just being a petty. Maybe I am. I'll give that to myself. Petty bit. Oh, can't cuss, so I'm gonna beep that word. I forgot what I was saying. Anyway, yeah, so her money business struggled, so in general, her year was difficult, and that's, it even made her faith and her relationship with God not as good, or uh, a bit more of a struggle than normal, is what it seems like. That's what I'm getting. I wanna get back to rooting my joy into what I know can, cannot be robbed, if that makes sense. And I wanna tell you guys something, especially if you're new in this business, okay? Um, it's inevitable that there's going to be tough times. You already know that about life. I don't have to tell you about that, right? You've all lived and you know, things are going to hit you in life, but it's no different in business, right? And so when you root your joy in this business in simply just your success, your rank, your paycheck, the team chats, whether they're popping or not popping, whether anybody responded to you or anyone liked your Instagram reel or it didn't go, if you root your joy in that, I can promise you right now, it is going to be a very, very bumpy, joyless road. What she's saying is the things that you can measure to see how your business is doing, if you root your joy in those outcomes and those things that you use to measure how your business is doing or growing, you're going to have a bad year. You're going to feel joyless. But those things are important. I mean, they really are. It's important to measure your success, right? You, you want to use logic. And so if you're profiting, how much? If you're not profiting, why not? What's going on? And you need to measure when it comes to business if you're not doing well like if things are not going well you probably shouldn't continue or you need to change something but what she's essentially doing is saying take those measurements you know those things that you use to see how business is doing take them away who cares how it's going that's not going to bring you joy that's not the part of money we want you to focus on well of course not of course it's not the part you want them to focus on because if they did they would leave like many others have. And you might be thinking, well, why do these Monet people have so much joy all the time? Is it because we've been on easy street of the six years we've been here? Heck no. It's because we've really rooted it in something beyond the paychecks, you guys, beyond the titles and all those things. And those things are wonderful. And we want to strive for those things, but we know that they are not what is going to make the most impact. And we know that they are not the things that, again, hold the source of our joy. So let me read this to you really quick and then I'm gonna pass it off to another dear friend of mine. That's so interesting, Connie. Because what you just said was you had a joyless year because you put your you put your hope in those things and they weren't doing well. You put your joy in those outcomes and they weren't doing well. So what you're saying not to do, you did. So it's very confusing. 
why you're pushing this idea to not do it when that's pretty much what people in Monique do. The joy comes from how much money they're making, how they're doing, what, you know, how big their team is growing, that kind of thing. And that's in general, in most businesses, but also all MLMs, all multi-level marketing companies, which people also like to say social selling, network marketing, uh, social retail, I don't know, all that junk, right? Affiliate marketing is not either of those things, any of those things, by the way, they try to call it affiliate marketing. It's not the same thing. Anywho, Connie does that. She puts her joy in those things. And because it didn't happen this year how she wanted, she had a not a great year. She's telling people to not do what she does, to not do what other people do that are uplines and top people. And y'all had so much joy the other years because money was doing well, or well in 2020, it exploded. So you had lots of joy. Money people look so joyful. Well, not anymore. Why? Because that's where you put your joy in. The outcomes of the business that you are a part of. I want to read to you what the world's definition of joy is. It is a feeling of great pleasure and happiness. Well, if you've ever been postpartum, you realize that th that's not very, that's not very um, hopeful for us, right? Because a great pleasure of happiness, I haven't had that for, I have a three-year-old, you guys. <laughs> I don't know when the last time that's been there, right? I don't want it to be rooted off of just circumstances of happiness, right? I would rather be rooted in this. And this is the biblical definition of joy. Biblical joy comes from the Lord. And here's the thing. It is a perpetual gladness of the heart that comes from knowing, experiencing, and trusting Jesus. And this is where I got tripped up. So I'm going to challenge some of you believers. I know God. I've experienced Jesus. I was not trusting in him with every single piece of my heart last year. And that is where my joy was robbed. It comes from knowing, experience. It's not just enough to know. I don't want you guys to get on this call and just know that we had some emotional moments. We, I want you to know and have the true joy that surpasses all understanding, that makes no dang sense when things are going like this, that you're still able to show up and be a light to other people. And people look at you and go, how does she do that? How does he? This is another horrible thing. Don't do this. Where you're saying you should experience Jesus in this call. You need to experience Jesus. And you're tying it to money like a ribbon on a, on a present, like a bow on a gift, whatever you want to say. Ugh. And then trust in him. So essentially what she's saying is trust in him, even if your business is doing bad. If you quit, you are not trusting in Jesus. While she didn't say those words, that's what it computes to. He do that. And it's because you have the Lord. So let me read you this. In John 15, 11, Jesus says this. These things I have spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. He didn't say that you have a joy that's kind of like mine, or you have a little piece of my joy. No, no, no. He said that my joy, meaning the joy that surpasses all circumstances, you guys, can remain in you and your joy might be full. Not halfway full, not a quarter of the way full, not only full when your health is there, not only full when your ranks are there, not only full when the paycheck is there, full. Okay, but God also, if, if you're saying God created all these things, he created the world, he created love, blah, 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 that means he created logic as well. And he wants logic to be used, right? He didn't create it for you to ignore it and throw it in the trash. Use logic like you use joy, love, all of those things. Those are just as important, but they're not going to talk about logic. They're not going to say how important those things are. And she's using this, this verse like it's the only thing that God's telling you to do. It's not. It's not. There's many more things that God wants you to do just as much as he wants you to whatever she said. One of those things is logic. Use your mind that he's given you. No matter what winds are blowing outside your house, I promise you, I know it and I see faces on here who know it. There is a joy that we all can have and I encourage you guys to tap into that. I'm going to be doing that myself this year. That's why I picked this word, you guys. And I'll just leave you with this too. You all have brought me, even if I don't know you or you've not been on my team, more joy through just laughter and some funny, crazy good times that we've all had and more joy than you can even imagine. So thank you for letting me be able to do this as not just a ministry, but as a job with people that I love and I admire and inspire me. So let's read ourselves in some joy. Okay. Um, that's where I'm at for the year. I'm passing it over to my lovely, beautiful friend, Brittany. Are you there, Britt? Bringing back a bunch of memories from 2020. We had a little take me to church moment there. And just to be back on here tonight is so incredibly special. It gets me overwhelmed. I am currently at my friend's house. I'm in her office and I was sitting here going, what should I say tonight? What are the words that I want to speak out onto the people that are listening? And not only who are on here specifically, but for everyone within this company. And 
I kept just wanting to bring a little bit of hope um, to you tonight and to pray over you. So as we were talking, she said, read Psalm 65, 11, and it is the most perfect verse to start off this year. It says, you crown the year with your goodness and your paths drip with abundance. And I truly believe that the Lord loves us so much. He wants to give you the desires of your heart. Um, and as we start a new year, I encourage you to put your, how Connie said, your joy and your hope in him to seek him in all that you do, because I promise you, he will give you the desires of your heart. You maybe not on your timing, but he is so, so good to each and every one of us. Um, you know, when I first started, I want to read the rest of that. They cherry pick stuff. So I just want to see here is it in context, the entirety of it. You care for the land and water it. You enrich it abundantly. The streams of God are filled with water to provide the people with grain. For so you have ordained it. You drench its furrows and level its ridges. You often, you soften it with showers and bless its crops. You crown the year with your bounty and your carts overflow with abundance. The grasslands of the wilderness overflow. The hills are closed clothed with gladness. The meadows are covered with flocks and the valleys are mantled with grain. They shout for joy to sing. So I'm going to read the meaning, the commentary of it. The whole circling year from one end of it to the other, particularly that season of when the harvest is gathered in, the seed being sown, the earth watered, the springing of it blessed, and the corn brought to perfection, the year is crowned with a plentiful harvest. This may denote the acceptable year of the Lord, the year of the redeemed, the whole gospel dispensation, which you see in Isaiah 61, 2 and 63, 4, in certain seasons and periods of which there have been great gatherings of souls to Christ, at the first of its multitudes were converted in Judea and in the Gentile world, which were the first fruits of the Spirit. And in all ages, there have been more or less instances of this kind. And in a latter day, there will be a large harvest when the Jews will be converted and the fullness of the Gentiles brought in. I think it's important to know, like, what is the historical meaning of these things? So hmm, let's look at Bible Hub. Why not? Because it also, so it also shows the Greek. So Elcott's commentary for English readers. So what they're talking about is this new year being crowned. And it says they generally connect the idea of completion with metaphor. But the original thought in Hebrew word, as in the Greek word, God, I haven't read Greek in so long. I'm not going to read that word. Is probably to encompass. So when I'm reading about this, Psalm 6511, and with addition to the other parts of it, is that that past year in the Bible at this point, what they're talking about, was bountiful. It was huge. It was great. And so God has crowned this next year, essentially saying whatever. The verse is like uh, the thou crownest the year with thy goodness and thy paths drop fatness saying that that last year was bountiful this year because of that last year is crowned with his goodness which with Monet <laughs> the last year wasn't bountiful it was actually really bad so therefore how could she use this saying they're crowned with God's goodness in this example now of course this isn't like the historical, I mean, I, I'm not getting too deep in. This is just like touching the surface of what this passage means. So what she's doing is she's cherry picking and using this verse, which sounds nice and pretty, but that's not what it means. She's using it out of context, which a lot of people do. And it's just so annoying. It's like, wait, 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 what's the rest? Like, I need not just the one, but I need the whole section. And I want to know the historical meaning behind it. And I want to know the translation's from these words to Greek and what they mean in Greek, because that's how they were written, at least in the New Testament, the Old Testament is Hebrew. So pretty much what it's saying is what you've done before, right? Like your success from before, your hard work from before is going to bring you into this new year and God's going to crown the year with his goodness. Don't cherry pick my friends, because it might bite you in the booty. Let's continue. Out praying. Lord, what should I do for, for work or the desires that were deep within my heart, the wants, the whys for what I wanted for my life. The Lord knew those. And I prayed those out every night and he brought money to me. He opened that door. And I'm so thankful that I was faithful to not only open that door, but to walk through. And so my prayer for you this year is when there is a door that is opening or when you're seeking him and praying to, to not just go, Lord, why isn't it happening? But to, to seek him. And when he answers to go through and um, 
to, to actually trust in his plan and to give it your all because there is so much hope. There is, I want to read you something really quick and I just want to pray over you and I'll pass it along. Um, it just says our ultimate hope lies in God's goodness. And I truly believe that because we don't always know what tomorrow holds, even after we have planned. None of us knew what last year would bring. So there's not a surefire way to know what will transpire this year. But I want my year crowned with God's goodness. I want your year to be crowned with God's goodness, not just any goodness, because our, our version of goodness, the humankind often fails. People aren't good all the time, even crown people, right? Therefore, my heart longs for and hopes in and believes God's promise to crown this January through December with his goodness. And that is what I'm going to pray over you guys tonight really quickly, and I will pass it along. But that I just want you to walk away or I guess click off this call tonight with just a little bit of hope. Um, if you are new here, if you maybe don't have a relationship with the Lord, or you're just interested and intrigued and in what is this call all about? Um, if you have that tug God, I hope you're not new there. That tugging on your heart, open a Bible, seek him, ask questions, because I promise you will find true joy. Just like Connie said, you will find hope and peace and he loves you. And he has so much goodness in store for you this year. So with that being said, let me just pray over you really quickly. Dear Lord, I just want to come to you right now and I just want to pray. Lord, I can so emotional because of your goodness. And I pray over this company, over these businesses, Lord, over these women, these men that have decided to do something different, that have deep desires within their heart that only you know of, that you will just be with them, that you will guide them, Lord, that you will give them the strength, the peace, the hope, uh, the peace that surpasses all understanding, Lord. You have blessed me in my life so much. You have blessed so many. And for those that are struggling tonight, Lord, I just pray that you just put a blanket of peace and hope on them. Be with this year. I pray favor, Lord, favor over each and every single person, favor over Monique specifically, Lord. You have done so much to this business. Your hands are all over this business. Um, no, they're not all over this business. That is such a disturbing thing to say. God is not all over this business. Just because you pray and say something or say God's doing something, that doesn't mean he's doing that thing in your life. That is not true. You don't know. They don't know. But what she's doing is she's putting this idea that God's here. God's got this. God's all over it. You don't know that. You have no idea. Your million dollars a year, more than that, tells me that his goodness, it might not be so, it might be a little different than what God's goodness is for others who aren't making that. It might uh, be an emotional prayer because she wants to continue that amount yearly. She wants to tap into people's emotions. She wants them to hear her. You know, when someone starts to get emotional, you kind of tune in. And while I, I, maybe these are real, maybe these are real emotions. I haven't seen tears, but who knows? Maybe she, maybe there are, it's a computer, right? What she's saying, God's doing this, God's doing that, God's all over. No, that, that doesn't mean he actually is. You can say, God told me to do that really bad thing. God pushed me to do it. No, uh, no, we didn't. That, that's not how that works. Anyway, don't, mm. I need to, let's just watch so that I don't get demonetized. Let's just keep watching. We're in, intertwined in this business, whether people like it or not, there is your fingerprints, your handprints are all over it. And I just pray favor over every single person. I am so thankful. I am so grateful, Lord. Be with each and every one of the people that are on this call tonight, Lord. And thank you so much for letting us have a new day each and every morning for your mercies are new that you give it, you grant us mercies, Lord. And I just am just so thankful. So in that Jesus name, I pray. Amen. Okay. I, I'm like tearing up. I get to pass it on to my good friend. I'm so glad I could keep that together a little bit, at least for you guys, but Jess, I am so excited to hear from you. You have such a heart of gold and you light up the, the, the world, the zoom calls, whenever people see you. So with that, Jess. Hello, my sweet friends. Wow. I am. This is my favorite call, Brittany. That was amazing. You guys, thank you for that prayer. I just, Think about Jesus looking down on us right now and just how pleased he is with us and how much us coming together to glorify him and honor our businesses with him and our future and our families and friendships. It just, it just makes me so happy. So I just wanted to share with you very quickly um, our word. Nick and I, we've just pretty much been talking this week and praying and we're doing a little fast on social media. I know that's hard with our business, but we really felt called to it just for the week. 
but um, the word remain. And it comes from the verse in John 15. And he says, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says, remain in me and I in you. Just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. And he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces fruit because you can do nothing without me. Now, here is the best part. There's a note here on the side and it says, Jesus is not commanding us to bear fruit, but the command is to remain. And what I'm so encouraged by that is, is when we remain, then we, we are abiding in his never ending unconditional love and the fruit will come, but only then. And we bear fruit when and only when. Are you talking about remaining in Monet is the same thing as that? Are my pit, do I have pit stage? No, okay, thank God. Are you talking about remaining in Monet is the same as that context, my gal? How could you say that? Okay, okay, Julie Jo. Sometimes I gotta talk myself down, you know what I mean? Okay, let's just keep watching and, uh, wow. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe she doesn't mean that. And we're grafted in the vine and he, the Holy Spirit in us is the fruit producer. And that had me reflecting and I just wanna encourage you as this back last year, going from 2022 to 2023, is to look at the fruit. Was your fruit anxiety? Was it fear? Um, and, and you know, like, it's almost like you test the fruit, right? Like he says that in the word too, test your fruit. And to me, I just get so encouraged to know that I want the fruits of the spirit, hope, gentleness, kindness, um, self-control. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are the fruits of the spirit, by the way. I just, I, I uh, memorized it, so <laughs> I wanted to show off a bit. But I don't know if that's showing off or if that's embarrassing. Whatever discipline, like all the fruits of the spirit that, that God tells us we get when, just when we remain in him. So I hope that you feel encouraged by that in those verses and to know that, that, that it isn't in us, all the power, all the goodness, all the things he's blessed us with, they're gifts from him. And the only thing he asks for us is to remain in him and just stay connected to him. And I think when we do that together, that there is so much that he is going to do through all of us together, rooted in him. We are a big, huge, monate family tree. And when we're connected to him, nothing is impossible. So I know Nick has a song that hopefully a lot of you are familiar with. Um, <laughs> I don't there it is. <clears throat> she did. She said it. She said it. She didn't say it exactly like I said it, but she said it. So just another example of taking something out of context to fit your horribly disgusting agenda. Oh no, sometimes there's like musical things we can do while we are not tech savvy. So if this sounds terrible to you and you cannot listen to it, raise your hand in the chat so we won't go too long, but I'll let him go ahead and lead. Okay, so I'm gonna look at those lyrics. I mean, I can sing it right now, but I'm not going to. Uh, never in my life. Uh, again, well, I, well, actually I sang it to my husband the other night as like a joke because Okay, Cornerstone by it's by Hillsong Worship. Cornerstone, it's by Hillsong Worship. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, and I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. When darkness seems to hide his face. So, I mean, really, it's like God is my cornerstone, and I'm going to be in the cornerstone. I don't want to go into it much, but I'm going to skip it because, you know, thank you. Okay, so these next people you're gonna see are Tony's husband and daughter. I think she's 18, but I'm gonna probably blur her just because I don't know. She doesn't look 18, but I think that she is. I think she might be joining the business. I don't know, so I'm gonna blur her, but let's hear what they have to say. We love you, Jess, and thank you for everyone that has talked so far. I miss you guys. You are all amazing. So my word for 2023 is ambitious being, because I think we can all take more steps towards opportunities and our action goals. And comment in the chat what your word for 2023 is. I am looking at my notes, and I might get a little emotional. But again, comment in the chat what your word for 2023 is. Matthew 19, 26 says, but Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. With God, anything is possible. God is the biggest role in all of this, love. From an early age, I've seen all this love and care blossom into this amazing, it's like a flower. This amazing flower that has bloomed over, has it been eight years now? It has. And 
truly cherish it because that's what God would do. God gave us all this opportunity and I can't wait to be a part of this even more. And put in the chat what your favorite Bible verse is. Mine is probably Matthew 19, 26. I want to pray for just a second. <clears throat> Lord, take us to the next level. We thank you for all the blessings, love, and light that you have sent our way. May we all be lighthouses. Amen. That was amazing. But expect it because you're an amazing person. And so are all of you people out there. We've got 237 faith-based souls out here tonight. And my word for the year is believe. It's always been kind of a powerful word for me. I remember having a, a conversation. Okay, so I'm not going to talk too much about her and like what she said and did. I'm just sad that she sounds like her mom, Tony. Mm -hmm. So let's let's talk about um, Matthew 19. Let's talk about it. And you know, let's see. Do the um, what what version do I want to do? New international version. Okay. So Matthew 19 is Matthew 19, 26 is specifically in a section of the rich and the kingdom of God. It says, just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones? He inquired. Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. He, he lists the commandments, right? Uh, you shall not get false testimony. Honor your father and mother. Love thy neighbors yourself. He said, all these I've kept what do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have the treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away and sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to the disciples, truly, I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. So I'm going to pause right there because it's funny because all of these people who have spoken are rich, except that little girl, her mom is, her, her dad is, um, filthy rich. So it's so funny because it's saying you, you aren't going to enter the kingdom of heaven. If we're going to, if we're going to take what she said and what people are using, cherry picking with these verses, then that also must be true. That must stand as well. Um, then 25 says the disciples heard this. They were greatly astonished and asked who can be saved? Jesus said, Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. They're not talking about your monate business. They're not talking about the growth of your monate business. They're literally talking about people can be changed and saved through Christ. Peter answered him in 27, we have left everything to follow you. What then will be, will there be for us? And Jesus said, truly, I tell you at the renewal of all things, when the son of man sits on the glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on the 12 thrones. Okay. So on and so forth. So, so you've got to add the context to these. You've got to add context to these, my guys. I'm serious. Uh, you have to, because without it, you can just use it to manipulate people, which in my opinion is what they're doing. Okay, let's continue. Conversation with my grandma when I was about her age. My, my grandma gave me my faith. I learned all about God from her. And I remember asking her one year, Grandma, I just don't know if I believe. And she stopped me. And she said, Jay, it doesn't matter if you believe right now. God always believes in you. And that's been what's carried me through a lot of my life. And so I just want you all to know how much everyone on this call believes in each other, how much we all believe in you. I believe in you. And it just, it amazes me after eight years, we have truly built a congregation together. I've experienced it a lot in my life being around like-minded people, but there's just something about this group over the past eight years that has really given me a lot of pride in endless amounts of gratitude and love. And from the bottom of my family's heart, we love you all so much and we just believe in you so much too. And going forward through this year, please just remember, we all believe in you and there's nothing that we all can't do together. One of the people in my life that has truly grown the most over the past eight years. He said, there's nothing we all can't do together. Pretty sure it's what he said. And that's false. You all can't be in the top 1% together. That's impossible. That's that's how the multi-level marketing business structure works. So, I mean, I, could, I, I don't know what to tell you, but like you can't. That's literally, logically impossible to do. Okay, let's keep going. Is my wife, Tony, And seeing where she's at now, seeing where she's evolved into her faith, 
it's always been there, but now it's at the forefront of what she does on a daily basis, how she carries herself. And I'm just going to say that Tony's a sovereign citizen. I'm going to say that. And I'm not going to say another thing about that. I just want to add that in. Okay. Let's keep going. It's been a snowball. And I, the first time I really saw it was 2017 when we were at my nations in Houston and I saw her interacting with people at a, in a different way. And I've known her most of her life and just to see the growth and to see where she's at now, I just, I cannot tell you how proud of her I am, we are. So with that in mind, Catherine and I would like to turn it over to her mom, my wife, Tony. And we love you guys. Tony will be crying, just a heads up. And I'm crying. So this is gonna be a tearful, like two minutes, but um, I wanna tell you guys, I felt my faith through this company. So, I found my faith and it was at a, um, it's easier to believe that God is good and find your faith when you make millions of dollars from something, when you have everything that you need, it's so much easier to say, God is good. And for that thing that gave you millions of dollars to give you everything to find your faith through that, it's much easier. I just wanted to state that service that we had after Monations, but actually I had found it right before then. And Shannon Massey, if you're on this call, you'll, you'll know what I'm, the event that we were talking about. We were in Nashville actually. And I had proclaimed my love for Jesus and my faith. And so, sorry guys, that's the gift that this company has given me. And I'm just so grateful. And I just wanted to share one thing with you that I wrote down today. Um, as I was trying to figure out what to say, and I knew this was going to happen, but here, here it is. This is the God thing that happened. It's unexplicable and it changes you for no reason, no rhyme, no explanation in that one moment. And that is what happened with me. Someone in the comment just says, finding my faith here. Please don't find your faith there. Please don't. <laughs> Not in Monet. Go somewhere else. It's going to be really, that's, that's the, that's the water and the red food dye or the red dye. That's, that's that right there. You're going to have, you, you're not going to be able to separate them. It's so disheartening. Sometimes reading those things, I'm like, oh, come on, watch my video. <laughs> watch this person's video. Go read this. But doing what I can, doing what I can. And I am so grateful because every single person here on this call, every single person that knows me, that helped me grow into this role. Inza helped me tonight because I was really nervous being on this call and she prayed with me. So thank you, Inza. But I'm going to turn it over to Stuart right now. So Stuart, please. Oh, and one other thing I want to say, because this happened and a little bit of a personal uh, story for us, my adopted daughter found me last summer that I gave up for adoption and we're expecting our second grandchild. And that was all because of God and faith. It was all because of this. And so I am so grateful and so honored. So Stuart, please take it away. Stuart's the last one, okay? And then they end with worship or something. I don't know. Stuart's the last one. I promise. We're almost done. I just have a big wow. Uh, can I get an amen, amen from everybody? Stuart's the president of money. Stu, Mr. Creates a Fake Profile and Attacks People, in my opinion. Stu. A big amen. Amen. <laughs> it's... uh. It's interesting. Um, we talked about doing this and we're trying to find the right date. You know, we tried to do it maybe closer to Christmas or the week between Christmas and New Year's. And this is when it's come out. And, and a bunch of people decided to talk and we didn't actually tell each other what we were going to talk about or even what songs we were going to sing until about 10 minutes before this started. And so I had already decided, having prayed about this a bit, that I wanted to talk a little bit about joy, peace, and hope. <laughs> and so that's kind of funny. Um, my home in Florida. Well, it fits in with what happened with Monique the past year, how it just tumbled downward. So mm, it makes sense. Everyone would talk about it. Florida has a big sign in front of it that says joy. And um, I decided this, and Connie mentioned this, I decided this, this year that that was going to be my word for the year. My word was going to be joy. And, and you might ask, well, why? why? Why did you pick that word? And I picked a word because I talk a lot about being a light. And, and it, it occurred to me, and there are people in my life, some of them are on this call, who um, particularly on social media will make sure they let me know when I'm not being very lighthousey. I have a propensity from time to time um, to not be entirely lighthousey. 
And um, and so I, I just love, and if you don't have- Stu, we know. We know. Have people in your life that hold you accountable, then you should find them because, because they're great. They're great to have. And so I decided if I'm going to attract people with, with in being a light, I can't do that without joy. I can't attract people um, to, to, to this light. It's not me, but it's the light within me. Um, I can't do that unless I'm joyful. And, and I started to think about how do I exhibit joy when stuff happens, you know, when stuff happens. Um, but I do, and I exhibit joy because I have hope. And that hope brings me peace. Connie touched on this, but there's a big difference between happiness and joy. And people can make you happy. Cir circumstances can make you happy. Sadly, though, both people and circumstances can actually do the opposite to you. Isn't that true? People can make us unhappy. Circumstances can make us unhappy. And that's why the focus on joy, because joy comes from a different place. It doesn't come from circumstances. It doesn't come from people. It comes from the Lord. Joy comes from the Lord. And joy is not dependent on people or circumstances. And if I want to attract... Well, yeah, I mean, sure. But like, also, you need to be wary of those who bring you joy and who don't. Those are also important things. You don't want to just fully go, okay, Lord's the only one going to bring me joy. If other people do, great. If other people don't, great. You need to see who you want to be around and who you don't want to be around. Like, I, I think it's just common sense, right? You want to see who brings you joy and who doesn't. You want to see what brings you joy and what doesn't. Don't only rely on God for your joy. And, and I get that point, but also like be wary of other things too. If you want to attract people to our community, uh, to our community, even as Monet or a community of faith, um, or, or to our walk, and we have to, we have to be lights. And if we want to be a light, they have to see joy in us, irrespective of our circumstances. If they see in us that we're only joyful or only happy when things are going well, and let's be honest, 2022 wasn't an awesome year. <laughs> it wasn't, it, it wasn't terrible, but it wasn't awesome. But people have to see in us, if we're truly going to be lights, they have to see that we have joy, irrespective of our circumstances or, of, or of people making us happy. Toxic positivity, right then and there. And I'm not saying like, you can't find the joy, right, in the difficult times, because that's weird, like you totally can if, if you want to, it's totally up to you. But if you're not having a good time, you don't have to act like you're having a good time. If you're not joyful, you don't have to fake joy. You don't have to, that's exhausting, but that's what they're taught to do. Their president is even telling them this. So when people ask for my source of joy, I get to talk about my hope. And Brittany talked about hope. And I had written in my office this afternoon, I'd made some notes and I wrote, there's an old hymn and a newer version of that hymn called Cornerstone <laughs> that says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Now, the old hymn says, moves into, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. The song that, that Nick sang, talked about cornerstone, talked about foundation. I go here all the time um, because a, a, a message that had huge impact on me at my daughter's wedding was when the pastor told her and her husband, here's my message for you as a young married couple. I think it's a message for life. It's a message for our businesses. Find a foundation. Build a home or build a business, or build a life, there will be storms. And it's only when our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, when, when that is our foundation, when that, on, on, on Christ the solid rock I stand, when cornerstone, when a, when a cornerstone is what we fundamentally build our lives on, that's when we are able to exhibit joy irrespective of our circumstances. So on this third day of January, we're all filled with hope. Who isn't? It's 2023. It's a new year. We're all filled with hope. Um, Deb and I have a home in Maine. We have a home in Florida. In both our homes, this Bible verse, Jeremiah 29, 11, um, is, is prominent. Jeremiah 29, 11, for those of you who don't know, it says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. De declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Let me read it again. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm, for you, harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. You know, people want hope. People need hope. They cling to hope. 
And I have so I specifically remember going over this in my theology classes. Um, I, I'm reading, um, I'll put it down below, but it says stop taking, it's literally called stop taking Jeremiah 29 11 out of context. It says, sure, it might make a person feel better, but this verse, as we often prescribe it, is being taken completely out of context. It doesn't mean what people think it means. It's time to back up and see what the author of Jeremiah is actually saying. When it comes to reading the Bible, we can sometimes be so familiar with the words on the page, and then we read them, but we don't really understand them. We see the words and hear the words, but we don't make any sense out of them. Familiarity can breed laziness, and so many of our understandings about the scriptures happen because we are too familiar with the passage to look into, into it with fresh eyes. If we would come to the word of God with fresh eyes more often, we would realize that some of our most common interpretations of scripture passed down to us don't make much sense then viewed within the context of the passage. Like any author worth his salt, the writer in Jeremiah begins by stating the subject of the passage in Jeremiah 29, 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried in into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This verse quoted to countless individuals who are struggling with vocation or discerning God's will is not written to individuals at all. This passage is written to a whole group of people, an entire nation. For all the grammar grammarians out there, the you in Jeremiah 29 11 isn't singular. It's plural. And you don't have to be a Hebrew scholar to realize that one versus many is a big difference. And the verse just before is perhaps even scarier. For Jeremiah 29 10, God lays down the specifics on this promise that he will fulfill it after 70 years are completed for Babylon. In other words, yes, God says, I will redeem you after 70 years in exile. This is certainly a far cry from the expectation of this verse in what God's plans to prosper for us really mean. He did have a future and a hope for them, but it would look far different than the Israelites ever expected. So what? Some of you may be thinking, even when the verse is taken out of context, it offers value, right? God does know the plans for individuals. So it's just as well to keep prescribing Jeremiah 29 for those seeking God's plans for their life, right? Well, yes and no. We need to let the Bible speak to us, not allow our own personal bent to speak into the scriptures. Jeremiah 29 is speaking to the nation of Israel, and not just one person, then we should start with the truth in the scripture. Context matters. God speaks at a particular moment in time to a particular group of people for a particular reason. What this means is that God has plans for a whole group of people, namely the nation of Israel, and if we read, read on in the scriptures, we find that this promise was fulfilled. Those in exile returned, and then the nation of Israel was restored, and so on and so forth. But that's not the end of the story either. There's something to the out-of-context prescriptions that so many make using this verse. God is a God of redemption, after all, and he wants to redeem people and just put them on the path of whole, wholeness, just as he wanted the nation of Israel to be redeemed and whole again. There's so much more to this scripture than that, but that I remember talking about that in particular because people loved that, especially when they were graduating from high school or college or whatever. Um, so anyway, Monet, it's not for you. It's literally for the Jews of that time. Jeremiah spoke that to them, so what else? Also, it, uh, he didn't just redeem them. They had 70 years of exile which were not fun. And then he was like, oh, I have plans. And while you're gonna go through 70 years of exile, there are plans, don't worry. So context, my guy. So much hope for this year. I have the hope for this year in Mon 8. I have hope for this year in a brand new grandchild, two new grandchildren last year, new grandchild for Tony, new kids coming, everybody. I mean, I have so much hope for 2023. As, as market partners or as, as part of Mon 8, if we attract people to us with our joy, we have a whole bunch of hope to offer. And you know what? I've often said to, in a non-spiritual sense, we are in effect merchants of hope, right? Through the things that we are able to do at money. But I love that as Christians, the hope we are giving them actually transcends shampoo, doesn't it? <laughs> um, our hope, the hope that we have brings peace. And many years I've had hope. I'm a very hopeful guy, I'm super optimistic. But I want to be candid and frank and transparent with you. For many, many years, peace eluded me. Maybe it's my personality, a little bit of a fighter. Um, but I have... We know, Stu. I swear to God. It's my opinion, and it's alleged, but I know he made some Instagram that attacked people because he used his email. Whatever. <laughs> <sighs>
okay I'm over it if you remember if you know you know and if you don't I'm sorry it was a good time I found that peace was the missing ingredient and that if I truly wanted to attract people to me attract people to hope and joy there had to be peace there's a guy named Alfred uh, Albert Nobel and Albert Nobel was the inventor of dynamo and had a lot of work you both uh, he had a lot of work with uh, military companies and um, mistakenly, this is a little known story. I just, I just read about this last week. So Albert Nobel mistakenly in the New York Times was said to have died. Albert Nobel dies was, was a headline and he wasn't dead. And what they found was what he saw was what they were writing about him after he supposedly had died. And they called him the merchant of death. Merchant of death because he worked in, because he had invented dynamite, because he'd been uh, working with, uh, you know, with military companies. And so Albert Nobel decided from that moment on that that wasn't who he wanted to be known for. And now today, you know, decades and decades later, Albert Nobel is the founder of the Nobel Peace Prize. He went on a mission to change his life from being the merchant of death to being all about peace. John 14, 27 says, I leave the gift of peace with you. Not the kind of fragile peace given by the world, but my perfect peace. Somebody else talked about fear. I think um, Phil's first song talked about fear. The rest of this verse says, don't yield to fear or be troubled in your hearts. Instead, be courageous. You know, oftentimes we think about peace as being sort of passive. Uh, John 14, it's all about Jesus's discussion with his disciples in anticipation for his, uh, you know, D-E-A-T-H and records the promised gift of the Holy Spirit. Context context you can't use it for your own benefit because if you do i'm gonna call out i'm gonna be like whoa bro hold on whoop, back it up rewind wind it up you know what i mean peacemakers being passive but but true peacemakers in my opinion are courageous it's i think it's the opposite the, another one of my favorite verses um is john 16 33 and i tell you this and i think i think this was already been mentioned so it's all coming together i tell you this so that you may be at peace. In this world, you will have trouble. In this world, there will be storms. But take heart, I've conquered the world. That's peace. The peace that we get from taking heart in knowing, knowing the end of the story. So many of us here have read the book and we know the ending. Let me read that to you again, John 16, 33. In this world, I tell you this, so that you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have conquered the world. So as we pray over this year, my prayer for all of you, for all of us, is that we have a joy-filled 2023, that you all will be examples and instruments of joy, and that you will be able to point people through money, through this vehicle, through this opportunity, um, you'll be able to point them to the true source of joy and the promise of hope. Money is my ministry, and it can be yours. You can indeed provide people with hope through, you know, you, you guys, you hear me speak all the time, through product, pay, and people. You can. Product, pay, and people. Literally just said Monate's my ministry. Stu, that's not, that's, that's not how that works. And it shouldn't be. But once you have them in your community, you can show them what real hope is. And that hope brings real peace. And real peace brings contentment, assurance, and confidence. And that's the piece that we need to share with everybody this 2023. So I'm just going to ask Nick to, 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 to sing that again and, and sing it with us. And then I'm going to close in prayer. I'm going to pass this and we're going to go straight to his prayer. He comes in, balls a blazing, so be ready. Let's just pray. Dear Lord, we just uh, take this opportunity to thank you. Thank you for the way that you've blessed us, blessed our families, blessed this business. And we just uh, pray that um, in everything that we do, in 2023, that we will give you the glory. We pray to be instruments of joy, hope, and peace, that we will be able to point people, we'll have the courage and the, um, the passion to point people to true joy, to true hope, and true peace. I thank you for every single person on this call. I thank you for every person um, who's getting involved in this ministry. And I just uh, I say we give you all our praise. Bless this year. Bless us here. Amen. God bless you all. Keep shining. Okay, that's that. So, um, thoughts, takeaways, 
I think that this was a great example to really let us connect the dots, right? Because we talked about some examples and whatnot beforehand, and then we watched this and it was like, it fit every single thing we talked about pretty much, almost everything. So I would love to hear what you have to think about it. I want to know your thoughts on their video, your thoughts on what I covered at the beginning, and feel free to vent in the comments. Don't go to anyone else like any of them just stay here if you need to invent or whatever you want to do um peace and love to all the people who do practice a religion there's no hate there's no anything but this is manipulative and we need to talk about that kind of thing so thank you for being here i have other videos that you can watch like over 300 of them i hope you have the most amazing morning afternoon evening and night wherever you are in the world and whenever you're watching i'll see you next time I don't care about you and him I don't care about what has been I only care about yours